Okay, so we're going to move forward today. I just scared them, just got you frightened enough. <laughs> but I hope what I did with the first session was to give you some tools to use to protect your identity. But it is frightening. Those numbers are out there. And it can happen to any of you. And if suddenly you realize it's happened to you, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is the moment you get the idea there could be fraud involved, identity fraud involved, is write it down. Do not depend on your memory for anything. Make a written record of everything. Write it down. Keep records. You get something strange that supports identity fraud, hang on to it. Don't throw it away thinking this doesn't matter. Because when it first started it meant for me, it was the strange notice from the phone company. Made no sense. Threw it away. Oh yeah, when I had to pay the bill on it, I knew, wished I'd kept it. Because I didn't keep it, I got stuck with that one, the bill. Keep copies of everything. Like I said, not only did I not keep the record, I didn't keep a copy of it. If you have to release something, keep a copy of it. If you're using, you know, no matter what you have to release, never release anything that you don't have a copy of it. Now, you're, you, when you get a glimmer that you might be the victim of identity fraud, you start notifying the credit reporting bureaus. On the back of your handout is all the credit reporting bureaus. The first thing you want to do is put a fraud alert. This notifies the credit world at large that there's a possibility that whoever's looking for credit under your name is it you. Now, it will, could inconvenience you. It did me at uh, linens, linens and things or Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, they, if I took their credit card, I got a 10% discount. And if I had a major credit card, that was all I took. Well, because I had a fraud alert, it stopped it. Well, you want to know how upset I am about it? Upset after I didn't want another forty thousand dollars worth of bad charges to back up. The inconvenience of having that one transaction blocked has nothing to do with the inconvenience of dealing with the real thing. So, put a fraud alert at the least. Sign up. You may want to, put, if you're sure of, put a security freeze on. Now remember, I talked to you when I was talking about preventative, preventing identity theft, what a security freeze was. If you're just preventing it, think twice because of the inconvenience. If you have reason to believe you're a victim of identity theft, get that freeze in place. Don't worry about the $10. If you can't document your audit, they give them the $10. That is the cheapest insurance there is out there, is that security freeze. That stops it. Stops it. It tells the whole credit world at large uh, there's identity theft involved with this person. Don't touch it. Now, what happens if after you put the identity freeze on there if you need to use your own credit? Well, you can get it lifted. You can get it lifted for a period of time, or you can get it lifted for one person, for one company. Only one co company can get your credit information. There is a charge on this. I think it's around $10. Think about it. You want to pay the $10 or you want to back the $60,000 of bad charges off your credit cards? Sounds like a bargain to me. Now, the next thing that um, <clears throat> I highly recommend that you do is file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. If you look on the back of your handout, you've got their 800, eight, well, 800 number, except it's an 887 and their web address and their physical address. The complaint is very easy to complete. It can be done online. I'm too much of a tree hugger to print out and give everybody copies of a five-page form. But if you want to come take a look at it, then here's the thought. It is really easy. Why do you want to do that? The Federal Trade Commission is, works with several law enforcement agencies to do their best to stop identity fraud, and they need to know who it's happened to. Uh, that helps them in their uh, 
in their job, the information that you give them can help law enforcement information uh, uh, officials across the country track down identity thieves. Mine was the final one that put that person in jail for she only got six months, but that's better than nothing. That was the final straw. I would when that that commonality was the one that allowed them to identify. And this person had got away with quite a bit. Okay. You, they, they can refer you to the government agencies and company uh, companies that can help you, and they can and they will investigate companies for violation of the laws. If somebody has violated their laws and have uh, by a lie, in a way that allowed the identity thief to use your, they're going to get an investigation and they can get their hands more than slapped. The next one, and you'll notice under that is. Internet Crime Complaint Center. I only have a web address. I don't think there is a physical location. The Internet Crime, uh, Internet Crime Center is an entity, and I think it's a nonprofit that helps victims of cybercrime. If the Internet was involved with the identity theft, and it always is, that's their their job. I am not as familiar with this entity. This is the first time I did the research to make sure this, this was up to date. This was researched very recently to make sure there was nothing new out there. The web, they will walk you through filing a, a report with them. <coughs> but I have no phone number and no physical address. I think it's people that work with them. So I can only give you their web address and a recommendation that you do go through and file. Now the next thing is file a police report. This is extremely important. You file it either in your own jurisdiction, like I live in Rancho, so I would file it with the Rancho Cordova. When it happened to me, the cops were not very amendable. To take in police reports, they had to be, uh, the feds had to explain to them in words they understood as in you want the federal funds, start filing, taking stolen identity police reports. You shouldn't have the problem today. The moment, <laughs> uh, Susan, I hope that laugh is it that you know you don't have the problem today. <laughs> no, it's uh, I know that I did have the problem. They refused to take them right. because they no longer took reports on those crimes. Yeah, right. Well, they actually announced it on the news. Hmm. Well, when I went through the Internet, uh, yeah, the feds will, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you do need that police report. Now, remember I told you to file their, uh, your report with the Federal Trade Commission? Take this with you to the comp shop. Get the comp shop. Ask them to make a, uh, include this in their file. Get the police officer to sign off and takes your report to sign off on it. Because then when you need this to, uh, to document that you've been a victim of identity theft, you've got all of it in one set of paper. Because when you have to start dealing with getting, getting these charges backed up, because this is a case where you're assumed guilty until you prove you're not guilty. In this country, we're accustomed to the innocent until proven guilty, and when it comes to debt indebtedness, you're guilty until you prove you're not. They consider you to be the deadbeat. Always get a copy of the police report. Now, you've made your reports. As the victim of identity theft, you are, are fraud, credit card fraud. You are entitled to a free copy of your credit report from all three credit reporting bureaus. Get them. Go over them. Look for accounts of you don't know nothing about. Immediately. Go over your own credit card statements. You want to dispute all the fraudulent charges on your own credit card statements? and on credit, card state, on credit card accounts that you didn't set up. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing this. And this, uh, Susan and I can both assure you, those credit card companies are very cooperative at shutting down a, a, accounts that have been compromised. And the ones that I dealt with were equally cooperative at <coughs> getting fraudulent charges off. When you find those fraudulent charges, contact the the entity that they were made with and asked, do you have forms to dispute them? All of mine, those forms were in my mailbox right away. 
if they don't, then write your own letter. Now, this is a letter I found on the Federal Trade Commission website in 2007 when I first put this presentation together. But when I looked, I couldn't find it. If you want a copy of it, let me know. You also have my email, and of course it's electronic now. You also have my email address. If you need a copy of it later down the road, send me an email. And I'll send it to you right back. But get them in, get those dispute, disputes in, and get them in in writing. Verbal does not count, except no verbals. Some of you have been with security agencies understand that phrase real well, except no verbals. They won't. When you're backing up, up when you're disputing charges, especially on the basis of fraud, it must be in writing. So you can't just take it from that. When you get it resolved, you get that off. Get a letter from them. Oh, yes, I have a thick, I have a stack of letters. Fortunately, they're good. I think they're pretty close to 10 years old. Isn't <coughs> that one? Yeah. As for that letter, when you get it, keep it. I still, and I, this would have been 2002, 2003, yes, I still have a file that thick. This can make your life miserable as long as you're breathing. Keep records of everything. After the initial, and let me tell you, this has been pretty quick here. This is months, what I've talked about now. Is it takes weeks and months to find all of these fraudulent accounts. Establish the fraud and get them off your credit report. It is a long consuming. So I hope you were paying real close attention when I was discussing prevention. Because once you go through dealing with prevention looks delightful. After you've got all that done, you're going to need to continue to check your credit reports. You get the free ones because you were a victim of a problem. You're entitled to one free a year. I don't recommend that you get all three of them at one time. Like uh, some things that I have to do on an annual basis is, okay, I'll do that on, on my the month of my birthday so that I remember to do it that year. My birthday comes along, I got this laundry list of annual trucks. I don't recommend that. You want to spread it out because you can get the one from Equifax. Let's say, you know, we'll start with Equifax today. Then you wait for, and if there's nothing suspicious on it, you wait four months and you get the one from Experian. If there's nothing suspicious on it, you wait another four months and go to TransUnion. I really strongly recommend you do that the rest of your life. Taking, well, I don't know, we're retired. So you can look at it either way. If you're not, but for the younger, uh, for your, you know, advise your adult children, your adult grandchildren, check it every four months. You don't know what's going on if you don't check up on it. When you close the compromised accounts and set up new ones, be sure that you get new personal identification numbers or passwords, whichever works. Don't use common. Don't use your year of birth. I just tricked her out. Of, uh, somebody just published her year of birth on when they said happy 65th birthday, Luana. They published her year of birth. So anybody who's trying to break into her accounts is going to use her, if they could get it, is going to use her dinner in her birth. Don't use your oldest child. Don't use your own child's name. Grandchildren are pretty safe, especially if you have a good assortment of them. Mm -hmm. The biggest, but if you really want to you know, use it, you one misspell it helps. And all of us are used to uh, phone numbers 1-800 um, with a word, you know, that converts into numbers. Use that name and number, uh, part, part of that name and numbers. So somebody's got to figure out which grandkid you use their name on, which one of those alpha characters you transmitted, to, you know, you commute, change to uh, numerics, and a password that's consistent of Numerics as well as alpha characters is far more difficult to, uh, to breach. And if you really want to screw it up, 
screw up the uh, somebody trying to decode yours. Put in a couple of special characters like ampersands, except that can con- confuse the computer into thinking it's an email address. But you start putting on the, the little uh, symbols that we use to indicate bad language. Throw in a couple of those. Those of you who are former military from the days when you had a separate identi- uh, military identification number makes a great pa- uh, great uh, user ID. My ex-husband's user ID is RA1476052. When I brought that to his attention, he says, why didn't I think of that? Because it's unique. You never forget it. We've been divorced for 40 years, and I can still rattle off that service identification number. But don't use your social security number. Now, as retirees, we're, um, you know, most of us have Medicare. Medicare. And we're told to carry our Medicare number. And it has our full Social Security number on it. Not too smart. Excuse me, I'm going to leave the lectern. I need something over here. So how do you comply with carrying your Medicare card and not carrying your full Social Security number? You find a color printer, color copier, piece of cardstock. You photocopy the front and back of it. You know what your full Social Security number is. I've got documentation that I have Medicare coverage, except I'm with Kaiser and don't need it. But I blocked out everything but the last total. Remember, that's what the rest of the world is doing now. The only th- four numbers that you see anywhere is the last spoke. So if you have to carry something, feel a need to carry something that has it. Now, I didn't do it to the actual card cards at home. Photocopy the front and the back. I, I, what I did was took, stick glue and stick them together. Now, you can go get lamination if you want to, but I had a roll of uh, carton tape. All I did was cover it with carton tape. I have a durable document that shows I'm entitled to Medicare. If they need a copy of it. Willie Holloway, 83506. Willie Holloway, 83506. If they need my, you know, they need a copy of it and they need the full Social Security number, I can give it to them. And I've never heard of any medical office having a problem with this. They all recognize the danger of it. While I'm on the subject of of documents don't carry, Never carry a, birth, uh, a certified copy of your birth certificate. I won't even carry a non-certified copy of it unless I need it that day. And then there's another document that not everybody has thought about. Protect your Social Security card, protect your birth certificate, and protect even more your passport. Mm-hmm. You say, put my picture's in it? Ho, oh, oh, ho, give me that passport and give me two days. It'll be my picture in it. <laughs> It is the identity that that is, <laughs> that's better than a social security card, that's better than a birth certificate, is that passport. And if it, the passport card is equal, um, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, you can get the full passport that all of us are accustomed to, or you can get just a little passport card, it's only good for Mexico, Canada, Bahamas, and the Caribbean. And it's really for the convenience of people who run back and forth across those borders. Because, you know, you can live in Canada and work in uh, the state of Washington and cross that border twice a day. The same with Mexico, the Caribbean, the Bahamas. If you're going to get a passport, I recommend you get the full thing. But that one works. It's a little ID card. Protect that the same as you do anything else. But let's get back to making, coming up with PIN numbers. Don't make them simple. Don't make them obvious. Uh, most of, well, one of my Toastmaster friends, he's an IT and he's very much into security. He doesn't want a, pass, uh, uh, a password less than 12 characters, <laughs> and he wants alpha, numerics, and special characters in all of them. Okay, whatever. But it depends. On my, my financial institution passwords, they're as complex as Mark Holtz wants them to be. <laughs> you know, you want to look at my J.C. Penney. You know, if you could figure out the simple one that I use to get onto my J.C. Penney sign in, that's okay. My Verizon, you're not going to figure out any quicker than you're going to figure out my uh, go at my bank account one. So the more sensitive it is, the more you need to have a complex uh, password. 
I think I've pretty well covered the last point. Be very proactive in protecting your personal information. And once more, remember, only you can prevent identity theft. Questions? Very well. Madam Postmaster.